So, you know, I like this idea of buying businesses. And uh, now, now I should say this, though, as it relates to Amazon, the rules of the game are slightly different. And this is the amazing thing about Amazon is that they've made it so easy for you to start a business. Right. And this is why they've been so successful and they have so many sellers. I mean, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of third party sellers today. And the reason is that it's so expensive and easy to, to, to figure out how to, how to launch a product on Amazon. There's tons of consultants, there's tons of courses out there that you can learn from. Bread Ideas episode number 347. Hey, I know what'll cheer you up. Welcome to the Bright Ideas Podcast, where we let proven experts help you to find the next bright idea to implement in your business today. And now, here's your host, Trent Deersmith. This is unbelievable. This true force has never been fully understood. Well, hello there, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Bright Ideas Podcast. Man, I love doing these things. They're always so much fun. Because I get to interview really smart people like we're going to do again today. I get to learn stuff and I get to help you guys become more successful in your businesses. And that's always my goal, to extract all the best golden nuggets that I can get from my guests so that you can take those nuggets and implement them in your business starting today. And that's exactly what we're going to do in this episode. And before we get to introducing my guest, Ryan... Uh, one quick announcement and one quick sponsor message. First of all, the announcement is, did you know that we have a private Facebook community dedicated solely to founders of e-commerce businesses? That's a really great place to hang out if you want to learn things from people like Ryan, if you want to be able to participate in hot seats and get answers to your questions. And it's free to join. You can just go to brightideas.co slash Facebook. You can apply and somebody on my team will let you in. So that out of the way, let's uh, pay some bills and we'll be right back to welcome Ryan to the show. Today's episode is brought to you by Flowster. If you run an e-commerce business and are struggling to effectively delegate your highly repetitive work to your team, Flowster's workflow management software and pre-made e-commerce playbooks make hiring, training, and delegating to your team an absolute breeze. Check it out today at flowster.app. So Ryan, thank you very much for uh, welcoming, uh, for making some time to uh, come and join us here on the show. It is a pleasure to have you. By way of introduction, I would like to just let you guys all know a little bit about Ryan. He is the founder and CEO of a company called Recom Brands. And that is a company that is focused on buying and growing businesses, Amazon businesses rather, and they are one of the fastest growing companies in the space. Ryan started selling on Amazon in 2016 and he's been involved in all aspects of the Amazon world, including retail arbitrage, wholesale, and private label. So Ryan, thank you so much. Welcome. Thanks very much for having me. Great to be here. Absolutely. So uh, you guys did... 15 million bucks in your second year on Amazon. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. That was done mostly with, uh, with wholesale trading of, uh, you know, footwear and apparel. Okay. And did you organically build your way there or was that the, fir- the revenue in the first two years, was that the result of buying some other companies and, and, you know, bolting them on? That was all organic. Okay. Yeah, we so, bought we bought our we we acquired our first Amazon business at the end of our second year. Okay, so let, let's go back to now that people already realize you've accomplished some pretty extraordinary stuff in a very short period of time. Let's let's back up a little bit. Let's go to the beginning here. So, your background did it have anything to do with this? Did it lead you into this at all, or did it was it kind of irrelevant to, to selling on Amazon? Well, I mean, I I suppose somewhat relevant, you know, my background was commodities trading. So I was running a, I was running a commodities trading desk, but it was a physical commodities trading desk. It wasn't paper trading. It was physically moving commodities uh, from, you know, mines in Asia to, you know, to, to Europe and, and, and other parts of Asia. And so I suppose trading commodities and trading things on Amazon, there are some relevancies, but but not a lot, not a whole lot. Okay. So then what, led you into the world of Amazon. We, 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 it's interesting. We come from all different walks of life. Those of us who made it this way. 
Yeah. So look, I mean, in, in 2016, I moved to the US and uh, at the time I was looking for something to do. I was looking for a business to buy or a business to start. And at the time, you know, e-commerce was at around 8% of total retail uh, mm-hmm. and was growing at around about 10% a year. Uh, and I couldn't see any way that that trend was going to reverse, right, or, or, or slow down even. And uh, and at the time, Amazon was about 40% of total e-commerce uh, and gaining market share every year. And uh, and I just became massively bullish uh, on the Amazon platform because, you know, if you look at the lifetime value of a customer on Amazon, it's huge, right? The average Amazon Prime customer spends about $1,700 a year. Uh, so the lifetime value of, a, of an Amazon customer is tens of thousands of dollars. And, and so, and, and, and so um, you know, Amazon's always going to be able to outspend on marketing dollars uh, to attract a customer versus a standalone DTC site. Uh, you know, which is much smaller and whose lifetime value for a customer is much smaller. So I looked at that and I thought, this Amazon thing is only going to get bigger. It's only going to get better. Uh, and I still feel that way today um, because, you know, more customers makes, means more sellers come. And, and as you get more sellers and more variety, you get lower prices and that brings more customers. And the more customers bring more sellers. And mm-hmm. it's a flywheel that just goes around and around and around and spins faster and faster every year. And so, uh, yeah. And so, you know, that's what, that's what kind of uh, got me excited about the space, you know, and then, sorry. I was going to say not to mention just the whole searching for products is so ingrained in our, like when I, I I'm a very uh, avid shopper on Amazon. My wife tells me we spend about two grand a month between, you know, our replenishables and laundry detergent, cat food and all that stuff. And then all the things that I like to buy. I don't search anywhere else. I don't start my searches in Google. I always start my searches in Amazon. And I think that probably a lot of people do that. And it's going to be really, really hard for Walmart to break that mental pattern, don't you think? I think it's going to be very hard. Uh, But they look, they have the resources to be able to make a dent. Uh, I just think you know, the the culture is just very different. The culture at Amazon is so innovative. That, you know, there's that old expression, when you get to where I am, you'll be where I was. Mm-hmm. You know, by the time Walmart gets to where Amazon is today, Amazon will be way, way, way ahead. And, and so, yeah, it's going to be difficult for guys to catch Amazon. Sure. So after you, so you got started, you were doing wholesale, much like I've been doing. You, you did very well at it. And then at some point in your evolution, you decided that you wanted to start buying existing brands and doing a roll up is what it's called in the industry or or, or yeah. making acquisitions your primary focus how long ago was that when did you do the first one uh so the first one was december of 2019 so just about a, almost a year ago okay uh and we decided a couple months prior to that that that's what we wanted to do you know when i first started on amazon uh in 2016 2017 i had that idea uh, but the problem was, and many many people listening who were selling at the time will know that you know Amazon's terms of service uh, made it very difficult to to buy different brands because there were all these stories that if you owned more than one Amazon account, you mm-hmm. would get shut down. Like yep. there were people who used to sit in a Starbucks with totally separate Amazon accounts and get shut down for it. Uh, and so you couldn't actually implement the strategy at the time. And so we got focused doing what what we could, which was the retail arbitrage and the wholesale, and then. You know, over time, the, the, you know, Amazon loosened up that policy uh, and it became more apparent that private label was going to be a huge opportunity. And so uh, we decided then to, to go and start buying and acquiring some businesses. And you, somewhere in this journey, you'd raised $2 million from, in debt financing, I believe, from an individual. Was that before or after you made this first acquisition? That was before. before. So the, the $2 million came in right, right as I started the business. So, I mean, I tested for a few months by myself. Yeah. And then after testing for a few months on Amazon and selling a few shoes and a few different things, uh, a few toys and a few different products, just to learn how the model works and how the platform works, that's when I went and pitched to an investor the scale of the opportunity. And, and, and I think he was, he was impressed by my enthusiasm and sort of on a, uh, you know, sort of, uh, took a chance and took a bet on me, uh, which I appreciated, and uh, and we and we raised two million dollars in those early days. So I imagine this was a fairly high net worth individual to stroke a check for two million dollars because he liked you. 
yeah, he's, he's definitely a high net worth guy. Uh, but I also had a, you know, I'd, I'd had a background of having some success in my previous career. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, he did some reference checks. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think he, I think we sold him on, on the size of the opportunity. And the thinking was, we're going to start, we're going to start with, with this retail arbitrage model and try and grow that. And, and we may pivot and evolve over time, uh-huh. uh, which we did. And, and so we were, you know, we were always flexible and he always understood that the model may change. But ultimately, there was so much opportunity. You know, e-commerce is like a tidal wave. Uh-huh. Uh, and you know, he said, you guys are just, you guys just need to go figure out how to build a big enough surfboard to ride that wave. And, and so we've pivoted a couple of times to get there. But and now we feel like we're, we've, we've really sort of landed on, on, a, on a very sustainable strategy that we're very excited about. You know, that was the same when I raised money for my first company. That was the same reason the fellow gave it to me was he says, I, I think I, I've known you for a while now. I think you're smart. I think you'll figure your stuff out. I don't know exactly what, what it is that you're doing. I don't really even understand it necessarily, but I'm willing to make a bet on you. And, and I bring that up because there are probably people listening to this episode right now who know somebody like that. And it might not be $2 million. Maybe it's $25,000. Maybe it's $50,000. Maybe it's $10,000. But don't underestimate the ability to, of, of, to use your own relationships and credibility to, uh, to go and attract or to go and find or convince this type of investor. And, and Ryan, so just before we move off the money raising aspect of this, um, what does it look like for the investor roughly? Like what is he getting for his $2 million bucks? Well, the deal, the deal that we did with him was, uh, it, was a, it was a single digit interest rate, but he also got some equity in the company, okay. right? So you got a few, few, few points of equity in the company, uh, and then he had an option to convert that debt into equity at a later date, which he, which he ultimately did. So okay. all of that debt now, now sits in the company as equity. Okay. Yeah. And, and what percentage of the company did he end up owning? Uh, today, he has just under 20%. Okay. So given what you're doing and what you're building, his 20% is going to be by the time you sell this thing or do whatever your exit strategy is, which we can get to later, or you can talk about it now, he's probably going to see a pretty nice return on his $2 million. I would hope so. I think, I think so. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So you went down the path, you raised, you, you got started, you did the, what I consider the, the really the smart way to get started on Amazon, which is wholesale. Cause it's such a low risk strategy. You had some success there. You developed some credibility, you raised some money and then you thought, okay, I need to start buying brands. Um, why did you decide before we get into how you bought them? I want to talk about why, why did you decide, Hey, I'm going to buy these brands instead of launching them from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I am, um, I, I was always sort of interested in the idea of buying businesses versus, versus launching them. Um, and, in, and in 2016, sort of in between careers, uh, I, I, I went and did some studying with a, with a guy named Keith Cunningham. He's a business coach. And, uh, and Keith was, he's a fantastic business coach and he does a course on how to buy and sell businesses. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, he lays out the logic for doing that. Uh, and he likes to say that the hardest thing you can do in the business world is uh, to turn around a failing, failing business, to turn that around. The second hardest thing in the world you can do is to start a business from scratch. Um, and a far easier approach from a risk-adjusted point of view is to go and buy an existing business, right? And, and he used to give this analogy where, which I'll share with you, which he said, you know, imagine you, you want to take a, a flight somewhere, Right, and you get to the airport, and you ask the hostess, "Where's the Where's the plane?" And she says, "Well, she, look outside the window. You see that, that pile of rubble uh, on the on the tarmac over there? Well, that's your plane. You need to figure out how to assemble all those thousands of pieces, turn it into an airplane, and then figure out how to fly that thing." Right? He says, Alter-, and that's and that's what starting a business is like. He said, alternatively, you could have a business that's at cruising altitude at thirty thousand feet. You know, you go sit in, you inject yourself straight into the co-pilot seat. The pilot shows you the switches and the gauges and shows you how to operate the plane. And then when you're ready, you switch seats uh, and then you take over and, and keep flying the plane. And it's just a lot easier from a risk adjusted point of view to do that. Um, and so, you know, I like this idea of buying businesses. And 
Uh, now, now I should say this though, as it relates to Amazon, the rules of the game are slightly different. And this is the amazing thing about Amazon is that they've made it so easy for you to start a business, right? And this is why they've been so successful and they have so many sellers. I mean, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of third party sellers today. And the reason is that it's so expensive and easy to, to, to figure out how to, how to launch a product on Amazon. There's tons of consultants, there's tons of courses out there that you can learn from, Facebook groups, very collaborative community. And you can go and launch, you can go and launch a business relatively inexpensively and then, and then you know, figure out how to make it work. And so, uh, you, know, we, we, you know, we've done both. We've launched businesses on Amazon. We have several brands that we launched, you know, Greenfield Ground Up. And we've bought businesses. Buying businesses is a little bit faster. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, uh, it, it's faster. It's a, it, it's, it's a faster way to scale the business. But, of course, it's riskier. And, uh, and as you know, and I know, and, and a lot of people who've sold on Amazon know, it's tricky. It's not so straightforward. There's a bunch of, you know, there's a bunch of things you have to get right. You know, our first business that we bought dropped by, the first business we bought in the first month dropped by 60%. We, oh, made, a couple of small, we made a couple of small mistakes. And that was already with two years of Amazon experience. We made a couple of mistakes. And it took us, you know, it took us a, a fair while to get that thing to recover. Uh, but we eventually did, fortunately. Uh, so, you know, there's all sorts of risks involved, uh, but it's, but I always say this, you know, it doesn't matter what you do, it's how you do it. So whether you're buying businesses or whether you're launching them greenfield, both can be fantastic and successful strategies. Uh, and it just depends on how you do it and mm-hmm. you know, how well capitalized you are and, and, uh, and what, and, and I guess what the strategic objective of the company is. So if, and I'm speaking to the audience here, folks, if you're, we're going to talk a lot more about how he's finding these businesses and so forth. Uh, I do want to make you aware of two other interviews that I did on this exact topic in case this is a rabbit hole. You really want to go far down. If you uh, do a search on Bright Ideas for Shaquille Prasla or Bill D'Alessandro, um, you'll find that there are interviews that, that both of those fellows have built quite a successful business of buying other brands. So with that said, Ryan, deal flow is always an issue, much like a, a real estate house flipper. You want to find a deal, but if you're looking on the MLS, you're competing against everybody else who wants to find a deal. And in these markets, thanks to computers and transparency, pretty hard to find a a house to flip on the MLS. How do you, and then then there's in the Amazon world or the e-commerce world, there's all sorts of brokerages that are brokering these deals. Are you buying through the brokerages or are you creating your own deal flow of unlisted businesses so that you don't have competitors bidding up the price to levels that make it not worth your while to acquire the company? Yeah, so you know, broker websites are a place that we've that we find some deals, uh, and at the same time, we we get a lot of people calling us directly because you know we've got a lot of contacts and friends in the Amazon world now, and uh, you know we're uh, you know we, we we treat people well and and, uh, and we're always very friendly and, and and so we get a bunch of people now uh, bringing deals to us. Well, that's a nice problem to have. <laughs> yeah. So, is, but is that how it's? Let's let's go back to the beginning. So, this first deal, this first acquisition that you made, I think you said it was in January of, or sorry, December of 2019 or January of 2019. Correct, correct, December 19. Okay, yeah. how, how'd you find that deal? That was on a broker site. Okay. Yeah, the first couple, the first couple came from broker websites, and then. And now deals are magically deal follows deal flow is magically falling out of the sky for you. How'd you make that happen? I don't, I don't, I don't know about that, but it, I don't know about magically. You know, we've worked very hard at building a network over the last few years, mm-hmm. uh, and we continue to work very hard at that. Uh, and and uh, yeah, so we've started to get some more deal flow now. Okay, so. Speaking of deal flow, and that's where I would recommend, maybe even you, Ryan, you might enjoy it, but Bill D'Alessandro's interview, he had a very, very clever strategy for deal flow. And uh, I'll, I'll leave it to the audience to go check that out if that's a topic that they want to go into deeper detail on. So how do you identify a company that that you might like to acquire? Yeah, so you know when we look at when we look at businesses that we want to buy, 
you know, some of the criteria that we look for, for example, is, you know, do they have great reviews, right? You know, and, and, and it all starts with the product. If you have a great product that has great reviews, um, then it's a question of, of uh, just being able to optimize the creative and the branding and the PPC and the SEO, et cetera. But, but initially, we want to make sure that it's a great product, right? So, and we also want to make sure that, you know, something that's three or six months old doesn't work for us. You know, we, we like businesses to be at least sort of 18 months to two years old at least um, and have pretty stable sort of or, or you know, or growing sales, right? So mm-hmm. if it's dipping, that's also not a great sign. Uh, you know, and the general trend of the category you want to see improving. So if it's something like a fad, like a fidget spinner, that's not something we're really interested in. Uh, you know, <laughs> so so if it's if we think there's a sustainability to the business uh, and it's got great reviews, uh, then you know then then we like it. You know, we're agnostic to the category today, so mm-hmm. we don't mind. We've got, we've got products across you know a whole bunch of different categories. Uh, and uh, as long as they kind of meet that criteria, I mean, our business is, in terms of the size we're buying today, uh, the smallest business we're looking at is probably like half a million dollars in revenue, uh-huh. there or thereabout. Uh-huh. Uh, and, and, you know, we'll buy businesses today up to sort of five million in revenue. And, you know, as, we, as, as our business gets bigger, so do the businesses oh, that sure. we can acquire. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because as you, when you're at you know fifty million buying a half million dollar business, it's not worth the due diligence. But when you're only at a million, it's worth the due diligence. So, are you can do you have a filter or a criteria for X percentage of their sales must be outside of the Amazon platform to give them some diversification, or are you happy to go buy a brand that's basically Amazon's their only sales channel and it's the bulk of their revenue? Yeah, so we're, we're, we're pretty much all focused on Amazon today. So okay. uh, a business that has sales off the Amazon platform is fine. We consider that, but that's not really a core of our strategy today. It may evolve over time that we do that. Uh, but, you know, we're mostly focused on what sales are happening on the Amazon platform. So if it's 100% sales on Amazon, even if it's a single SKU, that's fine by us. You know, a lot of, a lot of buyers who want to buy businesses, you know, they prefer to have you know, dozens of SKUs under the one business because that provides them a level of diversification, right? Mm-hmm. If one SKU goes down, that's okay. We kind of take a different approach to that where uh, we have diversification across the portfolio, across sure. all the different yeah. businesses, right? So we're more than happy to buy a business that has a single SKU or two sort of hero SKUs, let's say, uh, under, one, under, one, under one brand. So that's how we look at that. So let's say you have that single SKU business, that's only selling on Amazon. So there's one point of failure, that one product, what type of multiple, how do you value that company to come up with a purchase price? Is it a, is it a multiple of revenue, a multiple of earnings? What does the math behind that look like? It's typically a multiple of, it's typically a multiple of uh, seller discretionary earnings. Okay. Right. So, I mean, you know, businesses on businesses that I trade anywhere from sort of two times to, uh, three and a half times, depending on depending on the size of the business, depending on you know, bigger businesses tend to get a slightly better multiple. Mm-hmm. Uh, a business that has too many SKUs, which is very difficult to manage, uh, probably won't get as as good a multiple for us anyway as a business that has fewer sort of SKUs with more concentration. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we look at the competitive, and there's a whole bunch of factors that we take into account. We look at the competitive landscape. <clears throat> we look to see whether there's room to optimize and grow that business right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Potentially taking it to Amazon Europe or potentially taking it onto other platforms. Uh, You know, and we look at the, yeah, we look at the competitors. We look at, we look at a whole bunch of factors. Uh, And, you know, how old is the business? How sustainable are the earnings? How big is the review mode relative to the competitors? Right? Are these guys a clear winner or are there, uh, or are there many others who have a similar kind of review mode to what these guys have? So we look at all of those, all of those factors, and then we come up with a valuation accordingly. And are you only buying private label brands? Or are you buying wholesale businesses as well? It's all private label brands. Okay. Yeah. Um, how do you manage the risk of selling on a single channel? So, and the risk I'm specifically referring to is account suspension because in the private label world, especially in certain categories, there's bad actors and they like to uh, do nasty things that can cause good actors to run into difficulties. 
So yeah. earlier we talked about how you in the you didn't used to be able to have more than one seller central account. Now Amazon is permitting that. So are you maintaining individual seller central accounts for all the companies that you're buying? Yeah, uh, at the moment we that's how we do it. We have separate accounts. Uh, yeah, look, it, you know this has been an interesting evolving kind of uh, issue. This uh, when we first started, that was the number one sort of biggest risk that used to kind of keep us up at night was. What happens if Amazon shuts you down? And actually, in those early days, we had, we've had we had three Amazon account suspensions already. I mean, we've been dragged through the mud a bunch with Amazon. <laughs> so so we've been there and done that. And and part of the reason for that was we tripped up some algorithm and they, you know, mm-hmm. Amazon shoots first and asks questions later, yeah, right? And do. so that was painful. But uh, but if you if you play by the rules and you do the right thing and you know your you know your your product is authentic, et cetera. You'll always be able to get back up, and certainly that's been the case for us. And so, you know, today we look at that and we say that's that's far less of a problem because, you know, number one, Amazon's not going anywhere. You know, third-party marketplace today makes up over sixty percent uh, of volume on the overall platform. So, so, so Amazon's not going to get rid of the third-party marketplace. And then it's just a matter of, uh, you know, making sure you do the right thing because if you do the right thing, you'll always be able to get back up. You know, even if you get suspended temporarily, it's not a you know, it's, it's, it's not going to bring the entire business crashing down for, for, for long. Right. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So you're now, you've, you've, how many acquisitions have you made total? We're almost at 10. 10. So you're doing almost, almost, one, there. almost one a month. Yeah, we've, uh, well, I mean, you know, we bought a couple of months ago, we bought three in a month, right? So, I mean, we're okay. starting to really gain some momentum now, uh, yeah, we're, uh, we're you know we're getting, we're, getting, we're growing faster. So how are you financing all this growth? Are you using SBA loans, seller financing, or have you got other some other types of credit facilities? Because the two million dollars, I would imagine, you've spent a good chunk of it already, if not all of it. Yeah, well, we've had some profits from you know from from our, from the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've also raised some additional financing, uh, and we're in the process now of closing a much bigger round. Uh, I can't. I can't sort of share details because it's it's it's, uh, it's still confidential. But we're closing sort of a few tens of millions of dollars over the next you know couple of weeks, and so uh, that's gonna that's gonna give us plenty of fuel to be able to to grow much faster and uh, mm-hmm. and drive some growth. Yeah. And so in this space overall, obviously you're not the only company doing this. Um, tell mm-hmm. me what, you know, is how many other companies are out there trying to do roll-ups like you are? Are we talking dozens, hundreds? You know, I have no idea what the number is. Uh, there's a, there's, there's definitely a few, right? I mean, guys are starting to pay, pay attention, but the space is very large. I mean, Amazon, Amazon third party marketplace last year was $200 billion of, of GMV, you know, $200 yep. billion dollars of sales. And, this year, it's on track to do about 280 billion, and I've seen some J.P. Morgan reports that say, you know, next year will be 330, and the following year, 420 billion dollars. So uh, that is an enormous marketplace. It's highly fragmented, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, the, the, you know, there's room for several players. Now, many of the guys focus on a specific category. Some have very different investment buying criteria. Uh, some only buy businesses that have you know very strong patents, for example. There's plenty of there's, there's plenty of uh, there's plenty of ways to go about this, um, and we you know we uh, we try to we try to uh, just focus on on doing our own thing and uh, and making sure we develop a reputation in the market for being fair, upfront, honest, easy to deal with, mm-hmm. uh, super efficient. You know we close these businesses in like 30 days on average, so we're mm-hmm. we make the process really easy for sellers, very efficient and. Um, uh, you know, and we pay fair prices. So, you know, there's, uh, there's opportunity for, 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 there's opportunity here. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. There is definitely opportunity. And I love, you know, your, your be the best buyer approach, always st- shoot straight from the hip, be honest, do what you say you're going to do. And that, that's, what's going to get you those referrals of other people saying, Hey, my friend sold their company to you and they said it was a really great experience and you didn't do, you know, you didn't screw them over and so forth. And so, I don't want to deal with anybody else. I just want to sell my company. to you. That's, that's what happens with Warren Buffett. That's why one of the reasons why the guy is so damn successful at what he does is he's got this reputation that he spent decades building. As a matter of fact, he's famous for saying that 
reputations take decades to build and seconds to destroy. So yeah, don't do yeah. anything stupid to destroy it. And I got to believe by taking that same approach, the volume of referrals that you're going to get over the next year, two, three, four, five, six, seven years is only going to go up. That's exactly right. You know, we take a very long term approach here. Uh, and we try to do good by people and we think that what goes around comes around and we believe that that's the right way to behave. And, and so far, you know, we've had some great feedback from sellers and, you know, it's awesome to see, a, it's awesome to work with an entrepreneur who, <clears throat> you know, who uh, sells a business, takes that money and, and buys a, a dream house or, you know, buys an investment property or, 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 or uses it for retirement. You know, we, one of our sellers was an 80 year old couple that used the money for, for their retirement and, you know, it, uh, it it makes us super happy. We stay in touch with all of our sellers, and uh, and uh, you know what we're doing, we think creates a lot of value for them and a lot of value for us. You know, mm-hmm. so it's, uh, it's a great thing. So let's wrap here for anyone who's listening, Ryan, who might have a brand that or a, a single skew brand even that they might want to sell to you. What is the single easiest way for them to get in touch? Uh, email is probably the best. You could email me, Ryan, R-Y-A-N, at recombrands.com, R-E-C-O-M, uh, B-R-A-N-D-S.com. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for making some time to be on the show. It's been a pleasure to have you here. It's, it's great being with you, and thanks very much for having me. So thank you so much for listening. If this is your first time or maybe it's a repeat time and you really enjoyed this episode, I would love it if you would like and subscribe and review on your favorite podcast listening app to get to the show notes for today's episode. Just go to brightideas.co slash 347. So that's it for now. Take care. We'll see you in the next episode soon. Bye-bye. Thanks very much for listening to the Bright Ideas Podcast. Check us out on the web at brightideas.co. All right, show's over. I'm tired.